please take your Bibles and join me in Genesis chapter 3. I thought we were going to finish Genesis 3, um, but we're not. And, and so uh, we're going to do Genesis 3, 14 through 19 this morning. Um, and the, the title of our sermon is, This Means War. I, I read this week that Elisa Bonaparte, Napoleon's sister, as she lay dying, someone in the room gravely observed that nothing was as certain as death, except taxes, added the dying Elisa. Now, I couldn't confirm that she actually said that, um, but Ben Franklin did write about this phrase in a letter in 1789, he said, our new constitution is now established and has an appearance that promises permanency. But in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. Well, I have plenty of thoughts about just how right he was to have doubts about the permanent nature of the U.S. Constitution and even more about the taxes part of that statement. But today, we find the Bible's clear and emphatic teaching about the certainty of the first part, death. Death is a certainty in our world, and our text speaks quite clearly to that. Before we look at the text, I'll mention that Genesis 3, uh, really the entirety of it is uh, written in a chiastic form. You remember when we began Genesis that the point of a chiasm is that the, the beginning and the end uh, have some sort of matching relationship and then there's a structure that works its way in toward a middle section. And I won't for time and um, for the time being not go into how all of Genesis 3 works in that fashion, but we can see that quite clearly in uh, the last passage we covered in here beginning in verse 8 through 19. God speaks to the man, then he speaks to the woman, that was 8 through 13, and then he addresses in our passage this morning, beginning in verse 14, the serpent, and then he works his way back out, and he addresses the woman and then the man. And so all of that really forms the center of this chapter where verses 14 and 15 of our text today are the, the, the central point uh, of chapter 3. So structurally, we have good reason to consider these two verses, 14 and 15, to be extremely important to the author. Also, theologically, we see that these two verses are incredibly important to all the rest of the Bible. Um, verse 15 in particular contains what theologians have called the Proto-Evangelion, the first proclamation of of the gospel. And so I want to read verses 14 through 19, and then I'll, I'll give a, an outline, a pretty simple one, and then we'll get to work on uh, these, these verses here. Verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field, on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So, very simply, we're going to consider these verses along three lines. We're going to see God's address to the serpent. We'll see God's address to the woman. 
and God's address to the man. So look with me in the first place at verses 14 and 15 where we see God's uh, pronouncement of judgment against the serpent. And the first thing to notice here is what God does not say. And this is would be this will be significant if you can recall what we said when we considered God's interactions with the man and woman in verses 8 through 13. What God does not say here is he asks no questions. He permits no reply from the serpent. When we saw the confrontation of the man and the woman in verses 8 through 13, I said that the questions that God asked to the pair were meant not for the purpose of condemnation, but for the purpose of drawing forth a confession. And the confession wasn't ultimately an end in and of itself, but it served a bigger purpose that the rest of this chapter outlines, that of salvation. And so when we get to his interaction, if you can call it that, with the serpent, there aren't any questions asked. He doesn't ask him what did he do or what he was thinking. He doesn't ask him a single thing, and he doesn't provide the serpent with any opportunity to speak otherwise. He gives him no chance to explain his actions to confess his sin. God simply comes to the serpent and pronounces judgment upon the serpent. And he curses him with two things in particular. Humiliation and perpetual conflict with humanity that would eventually end in his death. So first he curses the serpent with humiliation. I think that there's a general belief among Christians uh, that verse 14 of Genesis 3 teaches that snakes used to walk upright. You've probably heard this thought before. Maybe you've believed it before. Maybe you believe it now. Um, But if you recall back what I said back in Genesis 3, 1 to 7, there's good reason to understand that the serpent of Genesis 3 is something more like what we think of when we hear the word dragon than what we think of when we hear the word snake. Revelation actually calls the serpent explicitly a dragon in Revelation 12, 9 and 20, verse 2. And so whatever these two verses uh, or this verse in particular, 14, tells us about herpetology. It tells us more about what you might call demonology. Eden, as we've said all throughout chapter 2, was a temple. It was a sacred space dedicated as a place of worship. It was the place where God would dwell with man, and man was the priest of the temple. And yet, we ought not to conclude that man was the only worshiping being in the temple. I say this because of, say, Ezekiel 31. There, Ezekiel seemingly personifies the trees in Eden as wicked heavenly beings that fell into sin and were cast into Sheol. We also have Isaiah 6, which doesn't mention Eden, but it does describe what Isaiah saw in the the throne of God, winged seraphim, worshiping God with loud voices. The seraphim in Isaiah 6 are relevant because there are, um, I believe, four other passages in the Old Testament that use that same term, seraph, and they use the term in connection with a serpentine type of being. Two of them, Isaiah 30, verse 6 and 14, 29, explicitly mention a fiery flying serpent. In Numbers 21, the word that's translated here in Genesis 3, 1 as serpent, nakash, is used in in conjunction with that word seraph. They're even used a bit interchangeably. God sends fiery serpents into the Israelite camp to bite the sinning Israelites, and Moses makes a shining bronze serpent for those bitten to behold and be healed. And so there's this unmistakable connection between serpents and seraphim in the Bible, explicitly between Nakashim and seraphim in Numbers 21. And so I I take, as I indicated before, that this serpent in Genesis 3 is something more akin to the seraphim of Isaiah 6 than a talking snake with legs. 
And that's important because it helps us to rightly understand this judgment oracle in verse 14. The judgment here is what you might call metaphorical. It's certainly not to be taken 100% literally because snakes don't literally eat dirt as diet. They eat mice. I had a snake when I was a kid, and I saw him many times eat mice and not dirt. And so this image of crawling on the belly and eating dust all the days of his life depicts deep humiliation. Perhaps the connection, though, it, there is a connection with snakes. Perhaps it's in the way that snakes slither about on the ground that's meant to serve as a perpetual reminder that this serpent, explicitly identified as Satan in Revelation 12, has been cast down from his place of privilege into humiliation. Isaiah 14, 12 seems to speak of this. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down, you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. Micah 7, 17 describes the, the judgment of the nations in similar terms, saying, They shall lick the dust like a serpent, like the crawling things of the earth. They shall come trembling out of their strongholds, they shall turn in dread to the Lord our God, and they shall be in fear of you. And so the point is this, whereas this serpent had been, you'll remember, more cunning than any beast of the field, now he is to be more cursed than any beast of the field. He has fallen from his place of pride to, as it were, crawl about on the ground. And so... When you do see a snake slithering on the ground, think of the great dragon, the ancient serpent, cast down, laid low, and humiliated. But God doesn't just threaten humiliation. He declares outright war against him. He declares cosmic war against the serpent. And I want to make just two observations about this with you in verse 15, namely, the, com the combatants of this war and the outcome of the war. Uh, first, consider the combatants. God says that he has placed enmity between the serpent and the woman, between his offspring and hers. Well, who or what are the offspring of the serpent uh, or the seed of the serpent? Um, we're going actually to build an answer to this question over the next several weeks as we, as we work through uh, the rest of these early chapters in Genesis. Um, and, and so I think it's best to let our conclusions progress naturally as we, we work through the text. But the point is that there is a, uh, an army of sorts that the, the, the serpent will have uh, beings on his side. And mankind has been caught up in this cosmic warfare between God and the devil. Enmity has been placed between the woman and her offspring on the one hand, and the serpent and his offspring on the other. Now the offspring of the woman may seem upon first glance to merely refer to humanity in general. And yet there's an explicit singularity that works its way out in the next phrase that requires an individual rather than a merely collective identity of the seed of the woman. Plus, as we'll see in the coming weeks, it's impossible to see all of humanity as belonging to this category. Some people, in undeniably, belong in the category of the seed of the serpent. But what we're told here is that the seed of the woman is, in essence, a singular individual who will do battle against the serpent. Which brings us to the war's outcome. As two armies may send out a champion warrior to settle the conflict once and for all between them, so we have humanity's champion warrior and the serpent's champion warrior going to battle. And God, in declaring this war, makes it clear how it will end. It will be nothing but ultimate death and destruction for the serpent. The serpent and his offspring will make war against the woman and her offspring, and then the serpent will strike and wound humanity's champion, but in so doing, he will meet his end once for all. 
And all this, as we will see, becomes the constant refrain of hope throughout Genesis and beyond. Hope for the seed of the woman who would come to end the serpent's rule. And more on that in a bit. But I want to move on to verse 16 here where we see God address the woman. Having pronounced complete, utter, and irreversible destruction upon the serpent, the Lord returns back up that chiastic chain to the woman. He tells the woman that there are two particular consequences that she now faces. Greatly multiplied pain in childbearing and conflict within her marriage. And let's consider each of those. First, bringing children into this world would now be painful, exceedingly painful. In fact, from what I hear, PMS is very painful. Pregnancy itself, painful. The delivery, painful. The recovery from delivery, painful. Those early years of nursing and sleepless nights, painful. Even, if, even once you have older children, parenting is still hard and painful. All of it seems to contribute to this greatly multiplied pain that women experience in bearing and rearing children. Now, I know that in this church I don't have to mention or really talk that much about the pain of childbearing. You know it well, ladies, and you bear it well. But this doesn't mean that all pregnancies are equally painful. Some women have relatively easy pregnancies, but perhaps really difficult deliveries. Other women, to some extent, have it the other way around. Some have it, they're just miserable all the way through. Maybe you didn't struggle until after the baby was born. Others may really only struggle until the baby's born. Or Till the baby becomes a teenager. Right? There are a variety of experiences that fall under this umbrella of bringing forth children in pain. But nevertheless, pain is a very real part of the parenting experience. And in particular, especially in those early years, the the woman, the mother, bears it severely. But we also see a second judgment pronounced, conflict in marriage. God says, as it's translated here in the ESV, that the woman's desire shall be contrary to her husband, but he shall rule over her. Now, there are a a couple of different interpretations drawn from this passage that we should consider for a moment. One is that it's, it's been observed that in the Song of Songs, chapter 7, verse 10, um, that uses the same term, desire, that's used here. And it's clearly in a, a positive and sexual context. So what's envisioned in drawing a connection between those two uh, texts is that the woman has an overwhelming desire for a man, and so she would seek to build her identity on the attention of men in general, or one in particular, but ultimately it would result in nothing more than being some type of doormat for a cruel and exploitive husband. The woman was to desire the man, but he would rule over her. Another interpretation sees a connection between Genesis 3.16's use of the term desire with Genesis 4.7's use of the term desire which we will see uh, in just a couple weeks, where God tells Cain that sin desired him. Sin's desire was for him, but he must master it. He must rule over it. And the idea of this interpretive scheme is that the woman would, in some form or fashion, resent, perhaps resist her husband's authority. That's why the ESV translates it as, your desire shall be contrary to your husband. Um, So she's resisting his authority. She would seek to dominate and lead him rather than to be led by him. And yet ultimately, nevertheless, 
she would fail in her bid to gain control over her husband, and yet, and he would still rule over her, whether harshly or, or not. Now, ultimately, I think both of these views and various nuances of, of each of them have merit to them uh, and to some degree are, are plausible. Uh, my sense is that desire here in Genesis 3.16 should be read more closely with its use in 4.7 rather than the use of in Song of Songs 7.10, just given the proximity of the verses to each other, uh, just a chapter apart in the same book and with a very, very similar structure, uh, syntactical structure. But the word is rare. I, I think those are the only three places in the Old Testament that that Hebrew word is used. And so it's hard to be sure. So what do we do with it then? Well, I find that both views on their own, if viewed as complete framing devices for every human marriage in this fallen world, are inadequate. Some women, indeed, sadly, are doormats. But so are some men. Some men really are tyrants. But so are some women. Like we saw with the variety of painful experiences in childbearing, there are a variety of conflicts envisioned with this second judgment. It's possible that there is an intentional ambiguity here to allow for a multifaceted application to the conflicts that exist in this world in our marriages. This judgment is pronounced, therefore, primarily to establish the fact that, once, that what was once a peaceful and harmonious order within marriage has now become corrupted. In other words, conflict will now be a recurring part of human relationships, and in particular between men and women. So the battle of the sexes has begun here in Genesis 3, 16. And again, we'll come back to this uh, a bit more at the end. But let's press on to verse 17 where God addresses Adam. We see this in 17 through 19. As he does with the serpent, he begins by indicating that what follows, the judgment that follows, is directly connected what, with what the man had done. In his case, he says, you have listened to the voice of your wife and transgressed the command given to you not to eat of this tree. The man, rather than carrying out his lordly responsibility of protecting his wife and the garden sanctuary in which he served, he permitted insubordination and desecration. Therefore, because he permitted insubordination, first from the serpent and then from his wife, the man should now expect more insubordination to follow. God tells him that from a rebellious ground, he must now painfully work to eke out an existence. Previously, labor, while necessary, would not have been burdensome or frustrating. But now the ground, rather than yielding its produce bountifully and with great ease, it would produce thorns and thistles. And whatever yield the man was to obtain would come at the cost of intense sweat and toil. Ecclesiastes 2, 22 and 23 reflect upon this reality. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. As a result of Adam's sin, frustration with our work is inevitable in this fallen world. A world that is crying out in the futility to which it has been subjected. Techno while technological advancements continue to make our work more efficient and often more effective, the subduing of the earth that man had been called to do in one sense, at least on his own, is now impossible. We can strive and toil and sweat and labor, and if all we do is life lived under the sun, the futility of the world will match us stride 
for stride. In fact, the Lord goes on in verse 19 to say that rather than man subduing the earth, what he's now to expect is that the earth will subdue him. Man who was to conquer the ground will be himself conquered by it and return to the dust from which he came. We saw in Genesis 2, verses 4 to 7, that when God raised the man of life from the dust of the ground, he was teaching us to anticipate kingship. We noted there also Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel 2. The Lord raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy to, from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. And so the man of dust, having failed in his kingly duty at the tree of wisdom, rather than through obedience maturing into the man of glory he ought to have become, he must now return to the dust. He must now be preyed upon by the humiliated and dust-licking serpent. The king has been conquered, and so he must now die. All the medical and technological advancements in the world must ultimately give way to the reality expressed by the poet. Each man's death diminishes me, for I am involved in mankind. Therefore, send not to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Well, what do we make of all this? What, what conclusions, lessons, and applications can we draw from this passage? Really, just a couple extended ones. First, the curse is real and personal. These judgments, it's been noted by many, affect the man and the woman in their area of particular domain. The man, given the principal role of forming the world through cultivating the ground, is strapped with a rebellious soil that will now fight against him at every turn until he eventually dies and is swallowed up by the ground that he was meant to rule. The woman, given the principal role in filling the world through childbearing, is now strapped with painful pregnancy and conflict in her home with the man that she was meant to help. And we should note, the fall does not create hierarchies within human societies or within marriage. Genesis doesn't view the wife's subordination to her husband as part of the judgment the woman was made from the man in order to be his helper. In 2.18, the man had named her in 2.23, indicating a level of authority over her. In fact, it is exactly because the man and the woman upended the created order that perpetual conflict has now been introduced into the marriage relationship. And so, for ourselves, how has sin affected your relationship? married people in the room? How has it affected your, your callings? Men, is it difficult to lead and love your wife well? Not just because of something about her, it's something in you. You're now fallen. We are fallen. My difficulty in my marriage doesn't strive principally from my wife, but as I see it, and I need to see it as stemming from me. Right? There's something about you, men, now that tempts you either to be passive or to be cruel. Ladies, isn't it Difficult to follow your husband's lead, to support his endeavors, and genuinely help him to do what the Lord has called him to do. Not just because he's passive or cruel, but there's something in you that makes it difficult. All of us, aren't our, our respective labors so much harder than they seem like they should be?
bearing and raising children. Doesn't seem like it should be that hard. It's painful, agonizing at times. Engaging with your spouse is hard. Building a home together is now hard. And every person in here, man, woman, and child, we've all, effect, we've all felt the effects of the fall. Perhaps in one degree or another. But we all feel it in our relationships with one another, with our children, with the, the world around us. And all of us, like our father Adam, must return to the dust. Every funeral you attend is, on the one hand, a bitter reminder that there is a curse upon this world and our fallen race. Nothing is as certain as taxes. I mean, death. Look around the room. I I said this last week, but I think it bears repeating. Look around the room. Every one of us is going to die. It is inescapable. You cannot outrun death. And of course, this would be a horribly depressing sermon if that's where it ended. But secondly, there is real hope and will end at the beginning where we started earlier. But before we get there, even think about the the curse and, and the painful experiences we have in this world. Even in these judgments, God gives kindness. Even in the, and I say this carefully, but even in the, the pain of childbirth, there is joy. John 16, 21, when a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has come into the world. It is astounding to witness, and honestly unbelievable to witness, the radical and sudden shift that occurs when a child is born. Right? We have three kids, and I was shocked each and every time that the moment they were born, all three of them, my wife, though in unbelievable pain just seconds ago, though bearing it very well, in the next moment she was smiling and seemingly at peace. I don't mean to to minimize the physical trauma that women experience before, during, and after childbirth, but there's no denying that the Lord has baked some measure of mercy into the equation. Yes, there is pain in childbearing, but there is joy in it. And likewise, while man is now subject to agonizing, frustrating, and at times useless toil until the day that we die, we're not prevented from obtaining our daily needs and providing for our families from our labor. So even in the frustrations of this world with painful labors, sleepless nights, broken bones, leaky faucets, decimated houses, clogged toilets, jammed carburetors. I I don't know if carburetors jam or not, but whatever it is they do that they're not supposed to do. Traffic jams, I know that. But whatever it is, are you struck, even in the midst of those things, that God permits us mercifully to live and to multiply and even to flourish with joy? But of even greater significance than those things is the certain outcome of that cosmic war in which we now find ourselves. For the seed of the woman has come. 
We said earlier, this is the, the great promise This is the great hope of Genesis and all the Old Testament, that the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, of Isaac, and Israel is Jesus, who is called the Christ. He was born of a woman and through his obedience has brought about an ultimate reversal of the curse. The first Adam did battle with the serpent at a tree of judgment. And he failed. He failed to love and protect his wife. He failed to obey God and his word. He was conquered. And so he must return to the dust from which he was taken. The last Adam did battle with the serpent at another tree of judgment. He died protecting his wife. He died obeying God's word. And so he went into the ground from which man was taken, and yet he then came forth a glorious victor in newness of life, to be crowned the the man of wisdom, the man of glory by his father. And that king now bestows life and wisdom and glory on all whom the father has given to him. And so for the people of God, we should say, Sure, nothing is as certain and as death and taxes except for the resurrection. We don't experience that new life in full now, but in part, in stages. All right, we see this reversal in our lives now when those who place their faith and trust in the Son experience a partial renewal of the original order. Conflict still exists in Christian marriages. It's not as though you have conflict in your marriage if you're not a Christian. Come to Christ and no longer you have conflict. It still exists, but it's only really within Christian marriages that there can be hope that that conflict will give way to true peace and lasting order. Prior to the fall, husbands would have ruled kindly and justly. And lovingly. Wives would have joyfully and fully followed and helped. And both would have been happy and holy. And so would their children. But after the fall, men and women now find their respective roles frustrated by themselves and by the other person in some form or fashion. By her nature, sinful woman makes it difficult for man to rule. By his nature, sinful man makes it difficult for woman to follow. Through Christ, however, man is able to rule kindly and justly, though imperfectly, and woman is able to follow her husband joyfully and imperfectly. You know, one of the the things that I I say a lot in, in counseling is, You should strive to make your spouse's obedience to God as easy as possible. And that's what Christ in our marriages does. Of course, that's the cherry on top of the cake of the the salvation that we receive, the rescue from death and hell. But it is real. Labor of both kinds, for men and women, it's still painful. There's still mercy baked into it, but in Christ, it's given a renewed purpose as we work to make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey all that Jesus commanded. And additionally, marriage itself, Christian or not, Paul tells us marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. Marriage between non-Christians, therefore, is a blurry picture. But to the degree that the couple submits their marriage to Christ, that picture becomes clearer. And so we enjoy now, in part, what we shall experience in full at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Then it shall not be so much in our own marriages, which will give way to the greater marriage, but we will experience 
what God intended for his people in full in the marriage union of the Lamb and his bride when we are invited to join him for supper and to see and to take and to taste and to share the fullest degree and glory that we can imagine